Welcome everybody. Um, thank you all for coming tonight and I, and I want to thank Tom and Matt for coming here to educate us more about the K-4 and what possibly could be happening in the future. Um, I'm just going to kind of hand over to Matt and we'll let Matt run this because it is his program tonight and um, maybe save the questions for the end unless Matt states otherwise. Okay, so we'll kind of let Matt get all the information out and then go from there. Okay, so thank you. Thanks a lot, Jennifer. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming and taking time out of your evening. I really do appreciate it. I want to thank the library, too, right off the start. Very nice that they allow this facility to be used by community members that want to share some information. Uh, this is the presentation. It's on four-year-old kindergarten. And there was a, a recent change on Monday that I'll talk to you a little bit about. And it allowed me to shift the presentation and the topic a little bit uh, in the direction that I definitely wanted to go. First of all, who am I? You know, what, what, why am I presenting? So, a couple of things about myself. Um, I do believe in the benefits of 4K. You're going to see that there are monetary benefits for the school district and taxpayers. Uh, that's coming up later. Um, I do have a background in school financing. I've been a, a DPI certified science teacher for the last, well, since 1993, and I, I've always um, been kind of a nosy person and, and looked into those issues and understand them pretty well. But better than a lot of people, and that's kind of what got me going on this. Um, I will have two children in Waterford graded schools next year over at Woodfield. I'll have a kindergartner next year and then a, a second grader. And then finally, it was one of the school boards, Dan Jensen, I call it the Dan Jensen Facebook Challenge. I basically did not believe that uh, 4K could be uh, cash positive, I'll call it, for the district, and he challenged me. Some of you may have seen that. It's, it's available online if you want to see it. It's at the website I run, which is uh, wgsdmeetings.com, there's a little article called The 4K Showdown where you can read a whole string of emails between uh, Mr. Jensen and I and the school board as I tried to get them to uh, accept, as many people have really over the course of many years, that 4K is, is, does not actually cost taxpayers dollars, it actually saves taxpayers dollars. And then, so this was kind of the big revelation on Monday night, Mr. Jensen said, so in actuality, we will make money, and this is a very strange scenario, and I will give that to you, Matt. We will make money by adding 4K, so you heard that from me. And it's not really an apology, but you know, I'll take that. It's good enough. We're moving in the right direction. Uh, the overview breaks, I'm going to talk a little bit about brief history of 4K, uh, beliefs and program models, uh, some logistics, which is really the big thing, I think. Um, as you'll see, it does appear that a majority of the current school board probably now supports implementing 4K. Mr. Jensen stated that he did, and you can watch the whole exchange on, uh, he's the director of the Personnel and Finance Committee, and that's already, you can watch the whole uh, discussion in his comments online if you want. So don't just take it from me. Um, but logistics are really important because if we were to start with a 4K program right away next year, things would definitely have to start moving quickly. Uh, if we wait until the following school year, 15, 16, then uh, we can take a little bit more relaxed and slow approach on it. We are very, very lucky, though, uh, because Burlington Area School District just approved this literally about a month ago. Um, and it was Tom that brought what they were doing to my attention, and then I kind of jumped on that. And I attended several meetings and talked to their business manager and other people. I also talked to business managers and, and other local school districts to try to get all my facts and, and, and be uh, right on about this. Um, so many thanks to the Burlington Area School District, especially the second half of the presentation, because in a lot of the stuff I have, it's word for word from the information they presented. And you know, a lot of what they took was from uh, the Department of Public Instruction website. So I want to give credit where credit's due. So first of all, as I researched this, it was fun to learn that the Wisconsin State Constitution has talked about educating four-year-olds since the, we became a state. Uh, enrollment in 4K actually peaked in the 1920s, and then from a period 1957 to 84, they actually stopped funding four-year-old kindergarten. My understanding is they focused on uh, kindergarten, five-year-old kindergarten, and moving that to a, a full-day uh, type uh, program. Uh, but back in 1984, so 30 years, 30 years ago, uh, funding for 4K was put back into the state funding formula for public education. And in 2009, 80% of the school districts were already doing it. 
and uh, now this year 94 percent of school districts in the state of Wisconsin are doing it so when we think about really what's traditional schooling I mean a lot of districts consider 4k very traditional they've been doing it for 10 15 years um, historically it's been very popular and commonplace and really in just Waterford here it uh, seems new about this map being bigger and I put it sideways so you can see green is everywhere that 4k is already taking place in our public school districts uh, there's little a couple little white spots in different areas where it's not but that's kind of a graphical representation of the 94 percent let's look locally though because it's really important when we talk about being what I call and others call a destination community are we a community where when people and my family is one of these just in the last couple of years we lived in the uh, uh, Racine area uh, schools and as my daughter was approaching kindergarten we we knew this was a move we were going to make eventually and we were able to make it sooner than later but um, if we're a destination community how does that help us and as families are looking to move west as many do um, will they pick Waterford uh, certainly we know our schools are doing very well but with Burlington and all these other neighboring school districts if, if you kind of think that the schools are better out there west um, you may not look at some of the finer details and I can show you that just a single family that would move and decide to go to Burlington because they offer 4k or any of these other districts instead of Waterford is very costly to us um, and actually further causes our access to increase as opposed to decrease these are the only uh, school districts in the three county area that do not offer 4k right now and of course we would be in the middle there in uh, Racine County but these are the neighboring districts that do not offer 4k and by the way this whole presentation will be a lot online just like it is now I didn't put it on there ahead of time because I did want to meet people and have them come but at any time this will be there and you can share it with other people I would ask that you do that um, the whole purpose really of this presentation is to get information out there that we learned from Burlington and let's get the discussion going um, I realize not everybody's going to be for 4k uh, but let's have that discussion then let's hear why you're not and let's talk about it and when I say that I mean the school district hopefully the school district will uh, do that Go, go ahead. I'll let me. I mean, are we doing a discussion now? Well, not really. Not oh, now. No, yeah. Okay, oh, yeah, you probably came over. Yeah, we're going to, but there will be at the end. That's I'm, fine. I'm definitely questions and answers. Um, so, something about school funding <coughs> basics that I want you to know, and a lot of you already know this. Uh, we are a state that, up until just a couple of years ago, was committed to two thirds funding. It still funds pretty close to two thirds of the cost of schools. How does it fund it? Of course, it's a, a sales tax, it's your income tax, etc. Um, but not all districts get their two-thirds the way the state works and because every district is supposed to offer a quality and free education districts that have a better tax base are considered wealthier uh, their money <coughs> is disproportionately put into the districts that are poorer so to speak that, those are actually the terms that DPI uses a wealthy district and so right now uh, Waterford Grade School District uh, uh, the costs we call them shared costs the cost that the taxpayers local levy taxpayers and the state pay to educate our children uh, the state only pays about a third of it where on average they pay two-thirds and that's because we are considered a wealthy school district and that's important coming up so what is wealth? well it's, it's a simple fraction you take all the value of the property in the community and you divide it by the number of kids it's a simple numerator denominator and then you get wealth and um, 10 years ago in, in such uh, when there was a lot of building going on this was a growing community enrollment in the school district was growing and people had hoped and thought that it would continue to grow for a long time but then the, the housing bubble burst and the economy slowed down and we have now in the last I think it's four years we are a declining enrollment school district and uh, our wealth is increasing now, Get back to that in a second but I call it the death spiral because there's a disproportionate amount of state aid that you lose for every student that you that you lose or have a declining enrollment and right now we know that our enrollment is going to continue to go down for several more years because we have this large bubble in sixth seventh and eighth grade um, those classes are going to be moving off to the Waterford uh, uh, high school 
And so the incoming kindergarten grades is based on what we know with birth data and stuff like that are expected to be smaller. And the superintendent has projected that we'll lose about 30 students per year on average. I think that was for the next four or five years. So there again, just kind of graphical representation. Two years ago, we were same number of buildings, houses that were part of the tax base. It's called equalized value divided by a certain number of kids. So you can see the, the properties haven't changed, but the number of kids have. Uh, we decreased by 1.5% wealth from 11-12 to 2012-13, and then this year we decreased by 2.4%. And our wealth actual amount, it's now $878,000 and some change per student. So if you take, we have about uh, 1,600 students and you multiply that by that amount, you would know what our equalized uh, tax base is. Um, some people have asked and commented that, well, wait a minute though, uh, you know, house values in Waterford have, have, have gone down, but not as far as everywhere else. And actually I looked into that over the last five years anyhow. Uh, it, was, it was close enough to say they're equal, but actually uh, the equalized value, when I compared it to the equalized value of the entire <coughs> state, we decreased at a slightly faster rate than uh, other parts of the state. And by the way, there's the, the Department of Revenue for the state. You know, you get your income taxes and it says what your house is worth, but the state Department of Revenue actually looks at that and equalizes values all around the state. Um, because we did have a board member say that maybe we need to talk to the local uh, assessor and make sure that these values aren't so high and get them down and thought that might help. But that, they're equalized throughout the state. So it doesn't really matter what the local tax assessor does and how they value your property. In December, uh, Superintendent, uh, gave a presentation, this is a very important presentation, he talked about what is the fiscal outlook for the district for the next five years. And these numbers come right off the presentation. Again, you can watch the presentation online if you want. But we have a serious problem. His budget presentation said that our $7 million reserve fund that we have right now in just five years will be minus $1.5 million, basically bankrupt. You'd think that would have made a lot of headlines in the paper and there'd be continued discussion about it. There hadn't been a whole lot. Uh, there was a, one nice uh, article, but you know, to me, this is, this is a real problem that we all have to address. And of course, it will get addressed, but what it means is my property taxes and your property taxes are gonna go up a lot, unless there are a lot of cuts that get made, class sizes increasing. One uh, school board member talked about mothballing one of the uh, buildings and moving students to the other. I mean. Uh, I don't know if that was a serious comment or not, but th that's what was said. So let's look at why this is happening, though. Why is uh, Waterford not getting as much aid as other school districts? Well, I, I just went back about 10 years here, and I looked at the state's enrollment. So this is across the entire state of Wisconsin, and the enrollment has declined a little bit, but not a whole lot. From the beginning here, in about nine or 10 years, enrollment has only gone down about 2%. Now, if we take out all the 4K enrollments that have happened in that period of time, this is how the state's enrollment would have gone down. And you really have to think of this as Waterford is really on this line here because we haven't added a grade, we haven't added four-year-old kindergarten. So with respect to all these other school districts, our enrollment is shrinking. And remember that little thing with the house on top and the kids on the bottom, our kids are shrinking on the bottom and our wealth is going up and the state says, whoa, Waterford, you're so much wealthier this year than you were last year, we don't have to give you as much money. And so that's what's happening. Yet, there is no more value in Waterford, the property value is, is held the same. So what's happened, like it or not, and a lot of people don't like to talk about making money off of kids, but a lot of school districts have determined that whether you think 4K will ultimately help students or not, I mean, some people are still having that debate. I don't think that's really much to debate about here. But nobody can debate that if we start a 4K program here in Waterford Great School District, that when we increase our enrollment, enrollment with respect to where we would be if we don't start 4K, uh, that we will get a, a large windfall of money to not only pay for the 4K program, uh, but have a lot left over. And so how much are we talking about? We're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars per year. In fact, the cost of the 4K program, I use the, the amount $400,000. That would be assuming we get a maximum involvement in the 4K program. 
and that's assuming some rounded up costs. The superintendent uh, revealed something like $330,000 cost, and that included an entire extra bus for uh, Woodfield Elementary because apparently their buses are so jam-packed right now that if we even had four or five four-year-olds hopping on that bus that they'd have to add a bus. I don't know that you should really contribute that to the whole 4K program because the truth is a couple families move into the district next year, they're going to have to do that anyhow or move into the Woodfield uh, school area, they'd have to do that anyhow. Um, so then I just show this uh, again, so kind of what I said, relatively speaking, other districts have become less wealthy because they added enrollment through a 4K program. And that's the revelation that Mr. Jensen and others have recently had now that that, that will happen to us too. We'll become less wealthy, which when we talk, we talk about state funding is a good thing. I had done all this research and, and got numbers and talked with people at the Department of Public Instruction Finance Department because I understood why 4K was going to be really helpful and I was basically banging on the door of certain school board members and trying to get them to acknowledge this and talk about this and so because I would go to meeting after meeting and have them say first of all you know it was free babysitting and second of all the taxpayers uh, aren't going to pay for free babysitting and it's going to make the taxes go up and they want to do it so you know I really um, went after this and I talked with people at the Department of Public Instruction and they were a little bit hesitant to say that we should do exactly what Burlington and other school districts did that we call it a cast forward projection pretend you have all these new students because you started 4k they said this is what you need to do you need to do a past projection model you need to go back three four five years so you know what the state aid formulas were and you know what the revenue limits were and then you so I did that I said okay here's without 4k these are real actual numbers this is it this is how much we got in state aid, this is how much we as homeowners paid, this is what the total revenue was for the district, and this is how it changed over five years. Then I took these same state aid and revenue limit worksheets, very complex worksheets, and I added 72 full-time equivalent students, and you'll see how I get that coming up, and nobody's really debated that number. When I did that, these are the numbers I got. So this table down here summarizes how that changes. And you can see you go in the hole, in the, hole the first year, and I used a $360,000 cost because, of course, five years ago, costs were lower, so I'm not using the $400,000 amount. You can see it creeps up every year. It's close to that. But the first year, you do <coughs> go in the hole because state aid is always paid the following year. So this year, Waterford Graded is getting state aid based on the number of kids it had enrolled last year. And next year, it'll get money based on the number of kids that are enrolled this year. So what districts like Burlington have done is they just um, decided to increase the revenue limit and, and tax for that, knowing that they're going to decrease the revenue limit in future years by more than that. So it's basically the concept of a loan, just like you and I do. We get money from a bank, and then you pay it back. Well, we are very lucky because... Our school board has done a very good job of keeping costs down, and we have right now a seven million dollar reserve fund. It's over; it's like 43 percent of the annual budget. It's it's much higher than their own policy requires. It's much higher than the Wisconsin Association of School Boards recommends that school districts have. So we can easily fund this program in the first year. Now remember, I'm doing a I'm back five years, but you can also pretend this is for next year. Then in the very second year there would be a surplus of um, change in revenue. Well, you, we, here's my state aid numbers. Here's my state aid numbers. 8.2 million is what we did get. Had we had 4K, just over 9 million. You pay back the $360,000 from the previous year, 365,000 for the current year. And at the end of the second year, you already have a $53,000 surplus and you've provided free 4K or 4K for the students of the community. Then the big payoff comes in the third year, surplus of 452,000, and below this is the cumulative running total. Payoff of 300, uh, I'm sorry, additional surplus 303,000, 412,000, and without a doubt, nobody can argue that had we started 4K five years ago, the district could have provided 4K for all students in Waterford graded and would have $1.2 million extra in their reserve fund, or could they use that to decrease class sizes, or could have done that to decrease your property taxes with the levy, whatever the school board wants to do. 
that's not really uh, debatable. This is following the DPI uh, finance director's recommendation. I have a whole email from him and explains exactly how to do this, and I did it. That's what we get. Um, you know, you have to decide, uh, I, I, but my opinion is that that's really unfortunate, and that people that have been making decisions have not done their job in doing this homework here. Other school districts have set up focus groups. I have letters from parents, people have shared with me letters that they have sent to the district. Um, I, we, I've been at enough meetings to see people request. Uh, we have a board member, Dawn Blymel, she's here tonight to put her on the spot, but she really asked for this information over the summer. Uh, it's, you know, it's seven, eight months later, we still don't have it. I think we're going to move in that direction quickly, but it is very frustrating for me as a parent and a taxpayer and someone that believes in the benefits of 4K. Another way to look at this kind of a graphical representation, and this was a cast forward like in the year 2015-16, but if the shared cost to run the district without 4K is 17.4 million, and we add four hundred thousand dollars to that, it becomes seventeen point eight million. But look what this does to your taxes. The cost is a little bit less without four K, the total cost. But the state only gives us five point five million, and we taxpayers have to pay eleven point nine. If we have four K with a little bit extra cost, we get six point four million dollars more from the state, and all we have to levy tax wise is eleven point four. That's a half million dollars less levy in a single year. So that's just another way to look at it. I have heard people say that, hey, well, it comes out of one pocket or the other. It's, it's taxation, and I don't like it. And that really isn't true for 4K. The state has a certain amount of money that it is going to spend next year and the following year and the following year. The question is, do we get a small piece of that pie or a bigger piece? But your, your state income tax, your state sales tax is not going to change at all whether or not Waterford starts a 4K program. All we are going to be doing is taking the sales and income tax money that we currently send to all these other school districts that have 4K and keep it here for ourselves. That's all that's going to change. Nobody can make an argument that it's still our tax dollars and I don't want to start 4K because I don't believe in taxation. That, it's already happening. If you want to debate what was decided in 1984, that four-year-old kindergarten is funded uh, by the state, then you know that's a different argument, and, and you're going to have a hard time. Because I think anybody you talk to on whatever aisle they're on, uh, nobody's going to stop funding 4K in Wisconsin. So how does uh, one enrollment impact Waterford Grade? So one enrollment is one student full-time. And when you look at the state aid worksheet, you just tweak the enrollment number. It's very easy by one. You see that the aid we get from the state changes by over $12,000. And to educate uh, in a 4K program, uh, <coughs> like 1.8 students, by the way, because 4K is not a full day, but one full-time equivalent student only costs about 5600 I mean, that's really, a lot of people, that's hard to believe. What? You get, you get over 12000 but it only costs 5600 and that's it. That's, that's how the formulas work. And that's that little thing about we're becoming wealthier and we're not getting our share of the, uh, of the state dollars. Um, and this, I, you know, destination community, how do we compare and what can we do to attract families here? Uh, tracking families increases the enrollment and slows or stops this declining enrollment, this death spiral. It doesn't mean that we're not still going to have declining enrollment. It doesn't mean that taxes aren't still going to go up but they will go up at a much slower rate if you have a 4K program. And just look at this, you know, in one family, right now I know there are families that are looking to move out here. They've got somebody starting kindergarten or they're just, they're buying their first home and this is where they want to live. Are they going to pick Burlington? Are they going to pick Waterford? Uh, a family with just two kids at $12,000 per year in additional revenue from the state, that's $25,000 a year for every year they're here. And if they're looking at communities and we don't offer 4K and they can get it for free in Burlington or somewhere nearby, it's probably going to be part of their decision-making process. For those families that have children that are kindergarten or later, it may not be. Or for those families like mine that um, uh, you know, participate in 4K 
um, at a, a local preschool and there are other reasons that go into that decision, then they're still going to do that and it may not be as, as big a deal. But we, we have to admit that for some families it is, and just one family with two kids, it's a pretty significant amount. So 4K could increase uh, enrollment by about 5%, and this is how I figure this out. Nobody's, by the way, nobody's in, in the, over a month uh, in time that I've been talking with these numbers, nobody's challenged this. But if we have about 160 students starting kindergarten every year on average uh, recently, and we assume that 75% will decide to enroll in 4K, 25% just won't send their uh, children to 4K. They, they have stay-at-home parents and, uh, or they do a different type of daycare or a parochial. Um, but if we assume that 75% will enroll, then here's the equation, 160 students times 75% times 0.6 FTE. Uh, it's a little bit more than a half-day program. That's how you figure it out. That's how we keep talking about this number, 72 new full-time enrollments in a 4K program. Yeah. Is that a voluntary program? It is. Yeah, yep. okay. Good question. That's coming up. It's absolutely voluntary. Um, Burlington says that if you're going to participate, we would like you to take it seriously, and we're going to keep track of attendance and you're expected to attend. But it is absolutely voluntary. And this is just some numbers for those that are interested. How does this work? Well, a teacher and an aide, about $80,000 times four rooms. And then I'm. this is, again, pretty much from the Burlington's model. But when you talk about you know rooms, these rooms could be at an existing preschool, these rooms could be in the school district, doesn't matter. But for the purpose, this is how the costs come down. Even through in there, because Burlington did it, 50 cents per student for a snack, I guess, every day. Um, supervision, room setup equipment. Some of this is uh, one time. Uh, as you prepare the room and get ready for the program, they built that cost into there. Um, and that's how I get $400,000. Like I said, the superintendent has a lower number. It could be that he was using fewer students or, or had lower costs on what it would be to have a teacher, et cetera. I don't know. And then really where I think the debate is going to go now, and it's one of the reasons I felt it was still worth going ahead with this meeting, even though it looked like the school, uh, a majority of the school board members now will be moving towards a 4K program. The question is, do we try to hustle this now and make it happen next year? or do we just slow down and, and take our time and have a good following year? I personally think if it's possible, or at least we ought to spend a good 30 days on this and see what can be hammered out and get feedback, I really think we ought to start now to get this impl implemented next year because it's $400,000 difference if we wait another year. Um, it's another year without 4K available to all students and that they, all word is really important as you'll see coming up. If it, if it just can't be done or people are, are, don't think it can be done or not willing to try or they try and they, it can't be done, then it just can't be done. That's fine with me. But I think we have to uh, think um, at the double time. Yes? Uh, is this strictly a financial decision, basically? It's not for me, but for the people on the school board that were opposed to it, um, they, they didn't believe in the benefits or their, their comments were, I need to see the proof. Well, these are these are very hard things for even researchers to determine in depth uh, for sure. There's a lot of research that says 4K is is a very successful, very beneficial. Some of you in this room know a lot more about it than me, by all means. And then there are a couple of key studies that showed that uh, uh, early childhood, um, three and four year old schooling, benefited students. But then after three, after third grade, uh, some of the benefits were no longer de detectable. But those are really, it's a flawed um, argument if you try to apply that because that was, those were Head Start programs. Those were not district-wide 4K that I have all students enrolled. And so, you know, I know that some people will try to, um, I, I think we're past that debate personally, but, um, and when Mr. Jensen stated that he's now for it, um, if you know about the, uh, the leadership he has, and there are other board members that just seem to, Mr. Jensen wants to do it, they'll do it, and then, so it seems like it's probably a done deal. But they, they need to each, I guess, talk about it. Is there local control over the curriculum, or is yes. it federally yeah. type of? Yeah, um, there's a little bit of both, but that's coming up. Excellent okay. questions. I think I'm going to get to most of that. One thing that has also been missed over the last many years is that the state has provided a lot of grant money, up to $1,500 per kid 
per year for two years. And um, Mr. Jensen had talked about that in an email exchange I had, and then it changed a little bit when he talked the other night. But just quoting him from his email here, I just get down to the most important thing here. The average has been five to $800 grant money per FTE. So he's, because basically I had said, look, not only did we miss out on all this money, but we missed out on grant money too, because it doesn't look like there's any grant money left and there's no guarantee that the state legislature is going to renew that. And so I think he tried to downplay that. And his summary was, look, if that's true, we're only missing between 36 to $57,000. So that's going to come up again. Because people that will not want to do this right away next year, want to wait the following year, they'll say, if we wait another year, there's a chance that the grant will be renewed, and there's a chance that we can then apply for the grant and get accepted and have some additional money. But that money, $57,000, is nothing compared to the four hundred to $500,000 we would get by starting a year earlier. Remember, for every year the program is running, except for the very first year, it's four to $500,000 bonus uh, surplus revenue. So th that's why I'm not a, uh, for waiting another year. Well, and I, I also want all kids to have the benefit of 4K next year, not another year later. Uh, DPI information, this is right off the DPI website. By the way, when this is active on my website, you can click on, click on these links and go right to it. But at this time, it is anticipated that no funds will be available for the cycle six year one. So cycle six is 13 to 15, so I guess it would be cycle seven, then that would be 14 to 16 or something like that. I don't, Tom, you know more about that? You had looked into it too, but. Pretty much that <clears throat> it's running out, and now we're to the point that so many schools offer it. We're at 94%. The chances of the legislature saying, okay, let's re-up the ante here, what will be the point? There will only be a couple schools left. Why would they funnel more money into it? I think we kind of missed the boat with that opportunity. And I have a feeling of the 5% of the districts in the state that don't have 4K, a lot of them may be wealthy districts like us, and if somebody looks into this in the legislature knows that they're gonna get a windfall of cash anyhow, why do we need to give them grant money to do this? Um, so that, you know, that's probably another reason why they'll get cut. But we don't know, it, it, it may not get cut. But it's, it's small change compared to having the program. So as I get into some of these, how the program works and logistics, again, thanks to Burlington Area School District, they actually took all this down and they had a wonderful website and then about two weeks ago after it got approved, it just disappeared, vanished overnight. Google Cache, I, I can only find one document on there, so luckily I had handouts and I had to type all this stuff in, but um, got to give credit where credit is due. And um, so one of the things they found out is that, and, you know, it's a different community, so I don't know. And so, very clear, in Burlington, they found out that 30% of four-year-olds in their community do not participate in any type of preschool. And I assume that um, they're going to a daycare, I think that's a type of preschool, and they count that, because then their other statistic was that in Burlington, 66% do not attend a preschool, and then I think that's a, a place that offers a, a curriculum. So, I thought those were pretty interesting statistics. Um, this is a quote that you see everywhere when you talk about this 5K, I mean 4K here. Experts tell us that 90% of all brain development occurs by the age of five. If we don't begin thinking about education in the early years, our children are at risk of falling behind by the time they start kindergarten. You know, a lot of people um, provide all that right at their home. Other people get that provided through their preschool and their daycare or in other communities and their 4K district-wide program. Um, love this and, and we just, I don't think we can forget about a lot of the students that currently don't go to daycare don't go to preschool and are at home in an environment that is not fostering, fostering their growth uh, socially and mentally so uh, district-wide program does this it gives access to every single student uh, it ensures a common preschool experience so when they get in the doors for kindergarten the traditional five-year-old kindergarten they are on a much level playing field and it provides a sound, solid foundation for future school success. So how, what are the models and how does it work? I want you to focus on model one and three because Burlington kind of did away with model two and I think as you hear this, you, you might agree too, but again, I, maybe not. Maybe this community will really like model two, but model one is that you have a school site with a school district teacher. So we have a lot of vacant classrooms right now because of this declining enrollment and we can set up 4K at no additional cost. We don't have to build a new building or anything like that. that that's it. That's a benefit. Um, and then it's a district employee, a district teacher teaching uh, 
students. Model two is where you actually use a different site, uh, preschool, existing preschool maybe, or wherever, a, ch a church that has room, but you have a district employee, a certified DPI licensed teacher to teach 4K at that site. And then the third model, which is really the model that Tom and I are most excited about, is it's called the community model. So you have a community site like an existing preschool with a licensed pre-K teacher, but that teacher is employed by the preschool um, that, that, that the student would be attending. So model one, again, uh, I kind of described all this, but four-year-olds attend, it's a district room and a district employee teacher. Model two is where, it's probably for, for places that don't have room and they don't want to build a new building, so they find a, a building within the community, but they supply the teacher. And then model three, again, is the one that seems most exciting. Uh, 4K is housed at a community site that's at an existing uh, preschool center, or child care center. A DPI licensed teacher who is employed then by the child care center or preschool teaches the program. And then uh, each community site enters a contract with the district to offer the 4K programming. Uh, children attend class and then are transported home or remain at the facility for wraparound care of needs. So for parents that are working all day and currently have their child in daycare all day, then um, they might, if they have the space, decide to um, in the morning have daycare, then the 4K starts in the afternoon, and, or flip-flop that, you do it any way you want. Um, and then we can, you know, we can go into this and talk, and again, I'm not the expert on this, many of you know much more about this than I do, but you know, if you're not, if you're a preschool and you don't currently have DPI licensed teachers or you're a daycare, there are ways for you still to participate in this. Step. And I could see, depending on how this was done and what the community's reaction is, some preschools could very well um, have participation that is beyond what they currently are experiencing. I also don't know what preschools are pay, pay their teachers compared to what the school district will pay, um, but for those that are currently licensed and will continue to do this, it's possible that their salary benefits could go up. Again, I, I really have no idea. The blended model is what Burlington decided to go with then because they have to go around to the existing facilities and there are some requirements. They have to be buildings in good shape and have certain things to offer. But they are offering a blended model, so they're uh, between <coughs> one and three. So it, it's probably because they don't quite know yet. They have to look at who's enrolling, where they want to go, what uh, requests are, but they're going to have some on site. Right now they're planning to have one classroom in Burlington and the others was their proposal that would be uh, community sites, existing preschools. Um, I, I won't read, I think I've said most of what's on there, but you know, depending on space availability in the community centers and the programming needs of students, some district space may also be utilized, but their focus is these community sites. And uh, if the site is, um, you know, obviously in our publicly funded schools, they don't allow for religious curriculum, but for those preschools that do offer that, they would have to change that, but they could do, again, as a wraparound, the student could be worked out, the students could stay for an additional half hour, or if they're staying for the entire day and having daycare in the other half, then that could be worked into that. But again, those are the discussions that need to take place so we can find out what are the possibilities, and then those preschool centers would have to decide what, what's acceptable to them. Um, Again, talking about licensing, and uh, these, are, these are things that some of you probably know more than I do about. But there are DPR clock hours that have to be met, and uh, in, in Burlington, whenever the students attend the regular school district day, then the 4K kids do also. Has to be a DPI certified teacher that has 4K licensing, and uh, have to comply with any other contractual stipulations as outlined in the contracts. That's a contract between the district and the community center. Um, uh, responsibilities of the community center then, they would be compensated based on a per pupil amount. Uh, the per pupil amount would be based on what other school districts in the area are paying their contract centers. Uh, and by the way, this is just, again, what Burlington's doing, okay? If you look at this online and share this with somebody, this is not from the Waterford Grade School District right now. They are, they are um, uh, 
some of the members did follow the Burlington area thing. I saw them at the Burlington uh, meeting, so I know they know a lot of this, but this is uh, Matt and Tom sharing this information to get, get the conversation started. So reimbursement is tied to enrollment, not attendance. So if people don't show up, they don't get less pay. Students are counted for reimbursement of the, on the two reporting count dates, just like they are. It's the third Friday in September, second Friday in January. And reimbursements are done on a, on a timely basis as agreed upon. Uh, so here are some logistics and to answer some of the questions that you have. So participation in 4K is optional. You do not have to enroll uh, your child in 4K. Uh, it does not fall under compulsory attendance regulations. So in Burlington they said, look, if you're going to enroll, we want you to take it serious. We're going to encourage attendance and good habits because obviously in the following year where it is compulsory, then we want to make sure that follow that and do the same thing. 4K programming would be available to all eligible students and centers would, would comply with non-discrimination policies. Students would include those children who are four years old on or before September 1st. No tuition would be charged to families for the period of time that 4K is in operation, but of course uh, if there's going to be some additional services, then that would be worked out just how it is now with that preschool center. And the district, you know, doesn't have anything to do with that. I don't know if they would have some recommendation recommendation plans, or I really think that needs to be driven by the preschool centers. And that's another thing is, you know, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. So if you have ideas, um, I'll get coming back to this later on. But you know, Monday in just a couple days is our school board meeting. And I know there will probably be some discussion or comments about this, but that is your one opportunity per month to address the school board. Um, I do videotape that, and I videotape people that come and talk, so keep that in mind, but if that's your opportunity to share what your concerns are, to ask questions. They're not going to respond to you right away, but they're going to take note of that, and they're going to work, hopefully, on getting those questions for you. Um, Again, this is my words, the uh, graded would uh, make every attempt to accommodate requests for particular community centers. However, the district could not guarantee this due to space availability and programming needs. So, you know, just like if you, you want to have a certain teacher, you know, I guess I've heard you can make requests, but uh, usually they don't say yes or no. It just depends on how things work out. Uh, here are some more logistics. 437 hours of direct instruction and 87.5 hours of parent outreach. My apologies, I don't even know what parent outreach is. Can somebody help me please? Because I wanted to look that up before. It's, and um, where I was involved for over 30 years and they had early childhood, we did it four days a week. And the fifth day was um, home visits, bringing the parents in. Um, my parents came in with their child so they could see what we were doing and how we were doing it. So they're, it works fabulously if you're doing it right because then you're just, you know, the kids come home and you say, what did you do today? And a four-year-old says nothing. You know, so um, that gave the parents the opportunity. And then they always did, oh, you know, like, parent, that outreach would count as a field trip to the pump yeah. department in the okay. fall. And they would do activities, you know, as a group with the children and their parents um, before, like, a holiday. Okay. Thank you very much. Yes. Other well, schools have also used, um, like, reading nights or those kind of nights for example. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Uh, same calendar. Um, I guess most models are uh, five days of instruction for approximately two hours. <coughs> and then again, there's all kinds of flexibility, and there's all kinds of ways to do this. But both morning start times and afternoon dismissal times could coincide with the elementary schools. So the, basically, the bus, if if you're going to uh, Woodfield or you're going to this preschool center, the bus picks you up, drops you off there on its route to the other elementaries or wherever it's going, and or maybe a whole additional bus is needed, and then at the end of the day, the bus picks a student up if they are leaving the preschool site and takes them home or brings them to the daycare center where they're going to go for the rest of the day if parents want uh, the student uh, all day at care or preschool. So there's infinite number of ways this can be done um, and <clears throat> this was uh, some people had questions about this locally but I didn't hear any discussion about this I was really surprised at the Burlington meetings but 
your four-year-old would get on the bus with the kindergartners and all the way up through sixth grade if that's who's on your bus. And I, I, locally, I did hear some people that really a four-year-old get on the bus. Huh? Burlington, nobody was concerned about it, and I don't really know how I feel about that, but that is, the would add additional cost. Certainly, this any additional cost could be covered by the surplus revenue. Okay, let's have no doubt about that. But um, other districts in Burlington are doing it where the four-year-old rides the same bus. They do have to have additional busing, though, for the middle of the day, right? Because some of those students are going to go home, some are going to go to a daycare facility, um, or some need to be dropped off in the middle of the day. Um, and then, of course, in the afternoon, they take the bus home. Uh, went over some of this. There is no ratio. So just like right now, there's no ratio in sixth grade or second grade. The district has policy on that, by the way. But the policy is not very strong. They have the ability to really put as many kids as they want in, in, a, in a classroom. And again, that would be something that we need to hear from the experts on that. What really, you know, whether it's just one teacher, how many four-year-olds. I can't handle, you know, two at home sometimes, it feels like. So how many do you, can you handle and, and meet the needs of the students? If you have an aide in the room, is that required? Or, or how many students can you have then? So, these are all things that we need to hear from people that are experts on this, and you need to advise um, the school district. The school district does employ some people that, of course, have a background in this. Um, the assistant curriculum, what's the title, Vaughn? Uh, okay. uh, curriculum. She has mentioned at meetings that her previous district had a 4K program, I believe, so I think she's somebody with some, some background. So then the curriculum, and again, I don't know much about this, and uh, I had a wonderful little <coughs> chat with Barb the other day, and uh, you know, what are going to be the actual requirements for the curriculum? And one of the concerns, I think, is very valid is, is the curriculum going to address those social needs, uh, those growth needs that the students need outside of reading and, and writing and, and math and art? I mean, that's the type of thing we need input on from you in the community that have a lot of experience on this because I don't know anything about that. And trust me, Dan Jensen doesn't know anything about that. And we need to hear from a lot of people. Uh, in Burlington, though, this is what they're doing. 30% of the curriculum, they said would. I changed it to could. Focus on reading and language. 70% would be on those other disciplines. And then all necessary training and professional development in order to implement the curriculum would be provided by the district. So if you're a preschool center, and you are uh, offering preschool to four-year-olds, your employees, your DPI certified 4K teachers are going to get this curriculum and training and, and the professional development from the school district. Uh, certain students uh, with special needs, uh, just like it is done right now, K through 12, K through eight, um, they're going to be tested and monitored. They're going to have an IEP. It's going to be outlined. All of that has to be, uh, of course, abided by. And the district is responsible for providing the necessary staff and resources to meet the programming needs of the students. So when we talk about, you know, does that preschool center have to employ a, spe a, a special education teacher? No, that's going to all be provided by the school district. And again, how that exactly works and how often they spend time on site, I don't know. Um, so I think that, let me just see, so uh, let me just go to questions and then I want to wrap this up because I did kind of identify who on the current school board has been supportive of 4K and who has not. Um, I realize not everybody here has support 4K or at least district support 4K, but let's go ahead and have some questions. Yes, sir. All right. <clears throat> Thanks for the opportunity. I just want to stand opposed and I'll tell you why, guys. I, I never had any children. All right, so I'm not sure what a four-year-old can learn, what they can't learn, all right? I just know that my mother spent a lot of time with me at home. My dad worked, she stayed home. We were eating soup four times a week, and we learned, all right? We have a school system here that these numbers were shocking to me, that a good chunk of my taxes and yours all goes to the school district, all right? And in four years, they're gonna be in a whole $1.5 million, according to your numbers. No, it was the opposite. They'll have $1.2 million surplus. And that's if you go five years back. If you go five years forward, they'll have about $1.6 million. 
million surplus in the next five years. So oh. it's, a, it's the exact opposite. I wish I brought my glasses. Yeah. So. But anyway, oh, so that was, a, that was a plus. All right, it's I guess my question is, is your taxes are going to go down, sir, if we have well, four pages. You're, you're basing this on free money, all right? Money that can dry up any time. All right, that's the part that worries me. What happens years ago will not necessarily happen next year or the year after. And what happens then? You know, and that's the part that bothers me. I, we have, the Water for School District, I think, is in our pockets enough. All right? Um, Sir, I'll, I don't want to cut you short. No, go ahead. Anymore, but I, I do want to have this be a little bit more of a question and answer. All right, well, that's so just much. my opinion. Yeah. You know, I just, yeah. I don't understand well, why four-year-olds have to go to school at a cost of $80,000 for a teacher and for an age. I just don't see it. They don't okay. have to. It's voluntary. You said it was voluntary. I thought it was voluntary to enroll. They, they, don't have to. They, don't, they can stay home. They can stay home. The whole, the whole program is trained at home. And, and if you've got parents. someone that's there to do it, you don't have to send. That was my concern. I didn't want it to be something mandatory because I, I agree. I think four-year-olds belong at home. Yeah, so, okay, so, so if you have a class of, of 10 people in there, you have a teacher getting paid and an aid $80,000? No, I need jobs. This is where I don't understand. He, part of that, the math he put up there, is assuming the maximum. Let's say that every kid that was eligible, or most of the majority, wanted to take advantage of the program, then we would need X number of teachers. That was representation of that. You may be right, and it may be only 10 kids in the entire district that would want to take advantage of it. Chances are that wouldn't happen, but let's say it did. You wouldn't hire four teachers and four aides then. You would adjust it down to what you needed. And if enrollment dropped in the future, then you would drop the number of teachers you needed. Just like we do now as enrollment goes down, we adjust the number of teachers we need. If enrollment goes up, we get more teachers. So this is making assumptions. But at the end of the day, the biggest assumption is that if we do do this, we get more aid from the state that we're already paying as taxpayers. It's just going to other districts. But you may not get it. It may just dry up also. Right? Well, I mean, everybody's talking yeah. better. So uh, let's go. Yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. going to move on because this is for you guys. Yeah. Bottom line is that's my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. There's just too much out there I don't know about. And yeah. maybe I saw your numbers wrong. I'm sorry. I have to have my glasses. That's so okay. bottom line is you mentioned uh, a tax increase. You mentioned well, then a bigger tax increase. I think if we didn't have it. I think he's I mean, referenced before, after. Yeah. Well, whatever. What the bottom line at. is, you know, how much, how much can come out of your pocket? And this is for four-year-olds. You know, come on, mom and dad. But just, just before you leave, oh, sir, you got just to want you know, it, it's less out of your pocket if we have a four k program. If the money still comes in from the state, right? And that could dry up. Well, it's been there for thirty years, yeah, and yeah. I don't well, think yeah, that's true. It's been a Democrat state forever too. You know what I mean? Now we got Scott Walker. He did a lot of, a lot of things to you guys. You know, why can't he stop over things? You know, no disrespect to Mr. Walker, I'm a fan of his. Okay. So, guys, thank you for the opportunity. You're welcome. Thank you. All right, anybody else with, uh, yes? Okay, um, I retired in June, but I've done early childhood before that, over 30 years. And I was shocked when we moved here three years ago that Waterford did not have 4K, okay? If you even logistically, as um, Matt mentioned, go online and see every surrounding district has it. Okay, so the cost of living, when you look at the statistics from the state, is higher in Waterford than it is in Burlington, Muskego, um, McGuanago, Waukesha. Okay, well, if parents, if you want to, as you said, be a destination community and Parents are making a decision. I know when my daughter looked, there was a house they liked in um, Muskego, which had a 4K, which she would have purchased except they couldn't negotiate with the seller, okay? So they ended up buying in Waterford. Um, but that was one of her considerations. Obviously, I'm beyond that consideration. But um, I think the point is, it's misguided to say, what can you teach four-year-olds, okay? I mean, we used to think um, you could leave a baby in a crib and you didn't have to stimulate them because they weren't absorbing any information. Okay, that has been disproved in the last 50 years. Um, the earlier you stimulate kids, you know, the better it is, the more you introduce to them. Um, early on, you know, 
the better, as you said, the brain absorbs the knowledge. And today I was um, working at one of the, um, I was subbing in one of the kindergarten rooms and, in Waterford. And I don't know how many people are aware of what the curriculum is. I mean, the teacher was using, you know, the smart board, and these were five-year-olds, and the sentence was up there, whether it was six lines long, and they had to identify the words, and then they had to determine whether they needed a um, period at the end or a question mark, and um, the concepts, DPI has forced the school districts to increase what they're introducing to children at five. I mean, they don't go to kindergarten anymore, just to socialize. And I've also worked in the 4K title program as a substitute. And if these kids come in and they can't cut and they don't know how to socially interact, it's gonna put them behind the eight ball. And I mean, to me, one of the big things all those years was the kid's self-image. And if they cannot perform, and they don't know how to use scissors, and they don't know how to cooperate, it's, it doesn't bode well, and you can see more and more um, emotional problems. What school district did you work in? Um, the last one was Racine. Racine? Yeah. Well, Waterford High School is one of the better high schools in the country. They rate among the top 2,000, I believe. I'm sorry? 1, Top 1,000. I'm sorry. Right. So I guess it hasn't hurt them in the past not to have a 4K, but I, I could see its advantages. And I guess I could, to say income. it's kind of hard to compare the kids who are seniors now because, I mean, when my kids were little, I didn't work those years and I stayed home. Um, I just don't see that as an option for a lot of families today to That's offer true. that. And so, I mean, if you could project, okay, if we don't give these kids this opportunity now and in 12 years, how will they test? I mean, that's just the unknown. Yeah, but know. they've had 4K for 30 years now, so there, there has to be documentation. So it's why is our school doing better? To me, it shows that it's more that your kids are going to do better in school the more the parents are involved. It doesn't matter. I mean, you probably got it in Milwaukee. Look at what they're doing with their schools. Their schools have fallen apart. You know, I mean, look at other areas in the state that have 4K and where they're testing compared to our schools. It, your education is at the level that your parents are involved in your education is the lion's share of whether or not you're going to get a good education. Right, and, but I guess I learned by looking at when the school board changed the um, lunch program and they had identified that 20% of the kids are entitled to free and reduced lunches. I guess I'd like to know what those statistics were 10 years ago. And I guess I, I, I don't think every parent who's out there um, is unemployed and not involved by choice today, okay? I think the economy dictates that and I think we have a I don't know, a moral responsibility to, I mean, the big thing you see in schools all the time is, you know, it takes a village to educate a child. And I guess I think that commitment is necessary, and I, I, I do see the advantages of, you know, introducing this early. And um, I don't know if the statistics were that high, you know, 10 years ago for how kids qualified. Um,
in Waterford. They don't have any problem. Well, I, whoever that lady was that said that did not do her work, her work, because none of the daycares are built in Waterford. We do not have waiting lists. And I'll be honest, if this goes through and it doesn't go through the, <coughs> the preschools and daycares, we will go under. We will go under. When you say it, oh, you mean if it isn't a community model? If it isn't a right. community model. And so I'm not saying this that I feel that we could do a better job mm -hmm. because of that, but my first thought was I hope that they can do for the little ones the social skills that they need before they learn the other things that they need to do. Yeah. Because they need that. They don't always get that at home anymore. Yeah. They don't get the empathy. Yeah. They aren't taught a lot of these things that they are taught in preschool and they care. As my uh, wife, as my daughter was in kindergarten last year, and my wife helped out weekly in the classroom, and I would hear a little bit of, you know, what that was like. It really seemed obvious too that those are the skills that, if they were there, would allow that kindergarten teacher to be able to have more success. Not that it stops at kindergarten by right. any means, uh, but I hear you. And then, in just in one second, just um, what I want you to keep in mind, though, is that. I personally think the debate about if 4K is going to happen in Waterford is really over now. I think the question is, does it happen next year in 14-15 or the following year in 15-16? And I say that just based on the sentiment of a majority of school board members. Um, the one school board member the, that is most opposed, Paul Viral, um, to any type of, he's actually the one of the five members that even voted against the Title I funded 4K program we have right now, he is not running for school board again. So that seat is up, and we can hear from both the candidates at the end here, if you want, um, they can tell us about their positions on 4K, because one of these two gentlemen, Jordan, can you put your hand up? And then Tom are gonna be taking Paul's seat. So, um, but the truth is, even without that seat, um, I think there's gonna be a majority anyhow. So I. So that is the kind of discussion I want to hear. And now not everybody's comfortable speaking, but when you speak at a school board meeting, other people hear you. And now because they're recorded, a lot of people hear you. If you write a letter to the board or to the superintendent, you just don't know who's going to see it. Or if the board, and when the board sees it, if it doesn't, it isn't part of their feelings, you don't know where it really goes from there. And that, Fortunately, for three and four years, that has been the experience as people have written the superintendent, written the school board, it hasn't gone anywhere. And the director did email about this today. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, that's to you. Good. And, 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 and this is, you know, this is just a start, and mm -hmm. I, um, I hope the school board will pick it up. Maybe uh, someone else will want to do one of these coming up and, and keep the ball rolling. You know, I, I don't yeah. know. There was another hand, yeah. I agree with the preschool teacher over there wholeheartedly. Well, because I think a 4K uh, program, if it really was monitored for four-year-olds, I don't think four-year-olds are five-year-olds. I think that they need a whole different uh, premise. I, I do truly believe four-year-olds belong at home. I realize that they can't all be there, but if they can't, they should be in a place where number one, religion isn't outlawed, where some of the kindnesses and things that are given in most of the, the uh, preschools that we have in this area, um, I think that's terrible that they said, well, you can't have this and that. You know, these are children. They need to learn very gentle, very kind, very self-growing uh, things. And I would be very leery. I, I would not want my granddaughter going to a, to a school, uh, a, a regular graded school 4K. But I, now, I, I, I just, on the other hand, yeah. St. Thomas runs one. St. Mary's in, in Burlington run one. Um, are those not going to be considered 4K then, once something like this comes into a... Uh, into play? I don't know, but I, I want to back up a little bit. Remember the one slide where it talked about 30% and 70% mm -hmm. and 10%? <coughs> Remember, that is just something that Burlington, that was actually the recommendation by the Burlington administration to the Burlington board, which they then approved. But those, what you're bringing up is so very important as we move forward because you really are the experts. You are the ones that have been worth four year olds for a long time. And I, I believe yes. your knowledge far surpasses that of anybody on the school board or really employed by the school district other than some teachers. So your input is vital 
in making this the best opportunity for those kids and sitting down with the current kindergarten teachers probably to hear what their concerns are is probably another great way to start. Well, the religious aspect, you know, that's one that is, is kind of cut and dry. The, the current laws are that the state funding, at least through the state aid that school districts get, that wouldn't be part of that three hours. But what happens in the fourth hour or the other three hours if the students are all day or whatever, obviously can be, get very creative with that. But it wouldn't, I guess it would not be able to be embedded throughout the three hours. Yeah. And I don't know if we need to remind or not, but to know that to teach in a 4K, you have to have certification in 4K in early childhood. It's, it's a completely different degree, which is very sought after today. And I mean, even if you look at the recommendations from DPI, it says the newer studies um, best practice for young children supports a play-based curriculum that's rich in opportunities for social and emotional interaction language and communication skill development and acquisition of general knowledge. So it's not like they're taking a very intense math or reading program and putting it down to four-year-olds. I mean, that's the whole thing about 4K should be the social, emotional development and um, learning to interact with each other and how the kids know. <laughs> you know, just the basics of, like you say, they go into a preschool. And, and it is obvious, and I know from when it was implemented and we're seeing several years ago, it does have an impact on the um, preschools and the daycare centers and stuff. But this is not to be looked at as a, um, as a babysitting service, which I think some people, you, you know, will say, well, why are we going to have to pay to babysit these kids when they, you know, because it's only a half a day. So even if when both parents work outside the home, the parents still are going to have to come up with, you know, the other seven hours or six hours of the day, you know, and provide services for their children. That's why maybe in a community-based facility, again, you still have to have a DPI certified 4K teacher who instructs, you know, for that three or four hours that the kids are there. But then for some parents, it would make it easier if it was a community-based center because you know, their child care arrangements would be easier, um, which doesn't always happen if you use, you know, a public school facility. Now, I, um, I'm all for education. Okay. I've been teaching that for uh, 26 years. Um, my fears are that it will be a washed out kindergarten, washed down kindergarten classroom. Look what they've done to kindergarten. They've taken away their playtime. They've taken away their social time. They've made it an eight-hour or six-hour day, whatever it is. That's my fear, is that it would turn into something like that. But I think, I think every child deserves that education. I think there's families in our community that cannot afford to send a child to a preschool um, for that experience. Um, so I think that it definitely is a need. It sounds like it's going to be happening. Um, I, I would hope that the uh, board or the community of writers on, on the um, planning committee, that they would incorporate people that have been doing this for many years to see what we do in our classrooms, what children need, um, and, and go from there. Because I really do have that fear. I've heard things about Title I. I have not been in the classroom. So I, not speaking from my own experience, but from what I've heard, it's not very age appropriate. The current title one program. Yes. And I would not like to see that. And I know I know how the school is run, the grade schools, how much control is in there and what teachers can and can't do. It's very difficult. And we hate to see that happen to four year old children because they're learning through play and that, that's what they should be doing. And you can teach them of so many things at their age level. So it definitely has to be age appropriate and it has to stay that way. Yeah. It can't like in two years say, okay, now we're gonna start doing this. It has to stay that way. See, I, I guess I'm a person where I always view the glass as half full, but the, the four ladies that have spoken, you are, the what you know and the influence you can have, I think is tremendous. Obviously we have to look at what is the required what are the requirements in a 4K district-wide program where state funding goes? 
but once we know that, and my understanding is it is quite flexible, then the rest gets dictated by the school district with the input of people like yourselves. And so it's time, it's time to get active to get your foot in the door and make your concerns heard because those first, very first concerns are the ones that are going to leave the longest lasting impression. Sir? Is there <coughs> presently testing in the 4K program that you have taught in? Is there are benchmarks or? Um, the title program, the four year old title program that's in Waterford right now, they did establish a testing criteria, you know, and I guess um, identified children they thought were more at risk. I mean, is there a progress report kind of thing? Or? Oh, yeah. <coughs> I mean, these kids are, yeah, they go through the evaluations and she has to do, um, the state requires something called PALS testing in all four and five. And now it's even in the first grade. So this will yeah. eventually be part of Common Core and, right. and that yeah. whole program. Right. So there's accountability and I, I certainly um, empathize um, with the opinion that these programs have to be play-based. Um, the curriculum, yeah, it has to just be play-based. It has to be centered. It has to be, um, it should not be sitting down working at worksheets. You know, right. Socializing. All day. But we felt that way about kindergarten, too. We felt kindergarten should be an introduction and a play-based uh, situation and a half day. And then it was decided, well, maybe it should be a full day. And now it's gone way beyond what kindergarten originally was intended to be. Mm -hmm. And why won't four-year-old, uh, four-K be the same way? They lull you in with saying, we're just going to do this so nice and nice. And then as soon as it gets underway, nobody has any say in it anymore. And we but, find that in the whole deal with the school. Yeah, I see. It becomes too easy for parents to just enroll their kid in the free school district 4K instead of doing or paying for another option. And I think you get, you get drowned out is what you're saying quick action. I just, I'm afraid they're going to move it along the way they did. And I don't think it's doing children that, I and mean, it's not doing them a service to rush them for their time. You look at so many of the other countries and the way they treat their school systems, and at the age they introduce things. You know, when they're five years old, they're five years old, they're very little. They don't need some of the things. Some children aren't ready at five to learn some of the things that they want them to. And is that going to put them in that category with, gee, I must be dumb, I can't do this. Right. I, I resent that terribly with the way the school system is handling it. And that's why my, our children go to parochial school. At least we feel we have some say right. in the parochial school. At least they listen a little bit. I don't feel we have that with the public school. I really don't. Well, I, I could tell you over the last several months how hard it was to get me, for them, for me to get them to listen just about the, the dollars and cents of it. So I fully understand where you're coming from. But, but I was successful and you can be too. You really can, but it, it's going to take work you're going to have to voice your opinions and you're going to have to volunteer to be on you know a, a study group or a committee or whatever and, you, and, and communicate with others there are, we have uh, parents united for waterford schools we have the, the meetings website i do uh, the social networking it's incredible how many how much information you get out of people really it's, it's on hand over here yes yeah i was just going to say i'm a um, mom who was working about a month ago um, and now, now staying home, have four kids, and have fortunately have the opportunity to keep my kids home. I could, but I'm here because I would like to send my four-year-old to 4K. Um, basically for the social part, but to be honest, I don't really care about the education, to be honest, I, I care about the social because I saw my older two start in day, daycare as infants and go all through daycare, and now they're ones in school and one's now home with me. And I can already see an attachment to mom. And I saw, like I saw that he loved, or that he learned how to take authority from other people other than just me, you know, just by being in school. And so I'm looking for that. And I think that's a huge benefit to a four-year-old going to school. And, you know, he'll come home and play. It's a half a day of school. You know, he'll come home and play. And I get to still be an influence on him for the rest of the day, you know. but. I see that. I see a huge benefit of the social aspect. So that's just my my opinion, seeing both sides. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So. Yes. Sir. Well, and that's a lot of my concern with the 4K is that it's not going to be a social. One of the other things is it's going to become too structured. 
just like the kindergarten has, that it, it's going to end up not being play-centered based. Mm -hmm. the, they can only absorb so much. They can't, their, their, their attention span, as the experts over here can tell you, four-year-old, maybe 30 seconds. <laughs> you know, I mean, they're, they're very short, so they can't have these structures, and that's what they, they, the social skills have to be learned at that age, not reading and writing. Just identify a number is good enough in a letter. Right. And it's going to get too structured, and I'm just afraid that we're going to have to, you know, it's not going to be good for the kids. And remember, it is always an option. I mean, it isn't mandatory. So, but I think what we know once it's in place, a lot of people are going to fall back on it. I think is what we're talking about here. And that's why it needs to be done right. Several years ago, there was a survey done in Burlington, uh, <coughs> just of the kindergarten teachers. Mm -hmm. yeah. They wanted to know what they want the kids to know when they come into their classroom. And number one was like self-regulation, being able to sit, listen, follow directions, all these social skills, getting along with others, negotiating, all these yeah. skills that kids don't, well, being at home is great, and if you have siblings, it's great, but you don't learn that unless you're in a community. Right. So with the way, what is expected of kids as they go to kindergarten, first grade, and throughout school, if they don't have those skills, they're going to fall. Definitely going to fall. And being at home is great, like I said, but they do need that because they're not going to get it when they get into kindergarten. Yeah. So they have to have that already. And that's why preschool, I teach uh, three-year-old and four-year-old preschool. And it's like, now they need three-year-old preschool. I didn't used to believe that even though I taught them. Like, you know, <laughs> my kids didn't go to three-year-old preschool. But now it's like they need it because there's so many expectations on these kids at such a young age. They have to have those things under their belt before they can grasp learning. If they don't have that, those skills, they can't learn. If there's other things in their mind, right. they can't learn. They have to have those things under, you know, under control, be able to sit and listen. Yeah. So what? Well, I was just going to simply add to that. I think we've been talking about a lot of the kids that did go through a program and not necessarily addressing the kids who haven't because like you said, there is a lot expected in first grade. Um, I just went through that with Owen, my son, but the even bigger problem is the kids who like you said, maybe can't, parents can't afford to send with a 4K, that represent, represents a large portion of the kids in the community. And the thing you also forget is the time teachers then have to spend with those kids getting them up to speed in their kindergarten. And you're right, what is expected of these kids in kindergarten, whether it's right or wrong, but it's a lot. So to get the kids who have had no experience with any of this, whether socializing or not, a lot of attention then is have to be placed on those kids in the classroom. So then the kids who did have some exposure to it, they're doing good, but how much better could they be doing that? if more attention was placed on them because so much attention wouldn't need to be placed on these other kids, how much would we lift up everybody by doing something like that? I think that kind of becomes the question. If we get everybody involved with this or as much as kids as possible, how do we bring it up, then everybody to that next level? I think we do probably, I promised that there <laughs> would be lights out and everybody gone and equipment out by eight. I mean, we, can we, could we oh, keep talking until quarter to eight, yeah, for example? Fine. Okay. Let me just, I only have three more slides, and I want to give both candidates a chance to talk a little bit more because we'll, we'll just look at the dynamics here, okay? So um, Bob Castigran, the vote came up, and I have the article right online. You can read the whole thing, but there was a vote, and I actually have the, the board minutes too, but there was a vote, I thought it was the end of, was it 2012 that came from? It was recently. And uh, four were opposed to uh, starting 4K, and one was for 4K, and that was Bob. So I think it's safe to say that now knowing what we know about cost, that I'm sure nothing is going to change about Bob. Dawn, who's with us in the room here, really gets a tremendous amount of credit, um, as does the Hoffman family, because it has to do with letters that were written by the family and stuff. But Dawn is the one, if you look and watch the meetings, She's the one who requested all this information. I'm not going to put words in her mouth. These are going to be my words, but she did not get provided 
the information that was requested. It was a shortened version, and in, in my perception, it was a shortened version and not complete, and we never got the answers. So um, by seeing those questions and watching the discussion, and then, then it's on your radar screen, you start looking at news articles from other districts, and all of a sudden you piece this together. How come everybody else says this is going to save money? Um, and, you know, and then that's how I got on this fan wagon. So I did not call them and ask them, Dawn, you're 4, 4K, right? Still yes. nothing's changed. Okay. <laughs> um, I, Tom has made it clear once, um, once the dollars issue was resolved and we know that there will be surplus revenue. So what the district does with that is up to the district, but it could be used for lowering property taxes from where they otherwise would be. It could be for um, adding this reserve fund that we see as in a rapid decline, um, you know, for whatever. Dan Jensen has described, you know, it is free daycare, free babysitting. Um, he has, I think he's less, in, and you have to talk to him or listen to him and watch me. He doesn't appear, this is what he said, he says, I know 4K doesn't hurt kids, okay? So he used to be stuck on making it very clear that there wasn't this perfect research done to show that it helped kids. But his comments are, you know it doesn't hurt it. So as of Monday, March 10, 2014, he said that he would now move forward with a 4K program. And then uh, Paul Byro, whose term ends next month, is definitely um, not in support of it, but it's a non-factor right now, except for what might be decided in the next 40 days. I just put Dan Jensen on here because I think it's important to know the history that he's not someone that supports, he's not someone that believes 4K is really good for the community, but again, on Monday he switched. And then I think, um, I'm gonna, Jordan is here, and I want definitely want to give him time to share, because I don't know if, it, I know that the dollars were very important to you, and now that we know the dollars are not an issue, I want to let you speak since I have your name up here. But my very last slide is, you know, please stay involved. Thanks so much for coming. And, you know, you have to really think you have to attend meetings. Some of you are the experts. You know this. Your input is needed. And you get to speak on the school board meetings. There's one a month. The district has committee meetings. Those are also one a month. The committee meeting is the first meeting of the month. There you, there's sometimes a lot of minimal participation, but really that's where everything happens in this district. That's where all the decisions are made. It was one of the things that really bothered me because no wonder people don't go to school board meetings because when they do, there isn't any discussion. Somebody makes a motion and it passes, and then people said, well, hey, dummy, you gotta go to the committee meeting. So um, you really wanna get the nuts and bolts of what's going on. Go to the committee meetings or watch them online. And then, you know, don't stop asking questions and share your opinions. They're very valuable. And there are, these are the two websites where people are sharing stuff and, and then you can get additional information. Of course, the district itself, but that's obvious. So, with that said, Jordan, I want to give you an opportunity to tell us <coughs> how you feel. Because one of these two, like I said, one of these two gentlemen will be our school board member uh, starting in April. Yeah, so as he said before, I was not 100% for, or for 4K. Um, just because of the tax money and there's no real proof as to how much benefit it is for the kids. Um, the social aspect, I totally understand. I agree with it. With the new numbers that uh, Dan Jensen has found and the information that Matt has been able to provide, um, assuming everything is accurate, which it seems as it is, um, I definitely am more for the 4K, assuming it stays in the local preschools. Um, I would prefer to see it in like Today's Child, the Rainbow School, places like that. Um, just I was surprised that I was the only person and the first person to reach out to the local preschools and to find out what their input is. Um, you know, nobody, the people who are saying that it should be there, the school board, you know, them, nobody has contacted them to get their input. I reached out to them, they are for 4K as long as it is in their buildings. Um, as somebody who went to Today's Child, I don't want to see that building go away. I don't want to see that, you know, something for the kids to not be able to go to as they need uh, education and somewhere to uh, go during the day as the parents are at work. So that's kind of where I stand right now. Um, Dan's going to work on getting more finalized numbers is what he told me the other day. Uh, so once we get that, hopefully we'll have that on Monday and go from there. Okay. I, I do want to, my meeting, so I am going to just correct one thing you said. Oh, that's, that's fine. Great. Dan Jensen didn't find any numbers. Well, from what for, I... For three weeks, yeah, I tried to beat down Dan Jensen's door to get him to look at the basic math for yeah. those numbers. Okay. And then when he was 
had no other option. Okay, when I called his resource, which was the director of finance for DPI, and that guy basically set him straight, then then his numbers became mine. Yeah, I'm not trying to take anything away from what you did. I'm not trying to take on the stump, but you got to be careful. I'm not trying to take anything away from what Matt did. Matt definitely did a lot to kind of get this program going. Um, but just from the conversations I've had with Dan, he said he kind of talked a lot with the DPA. I don't know the DPI. I don't know, you know, the conversations that you guys have had. So that's between you guys. All I know is, you know, the things that you have posted, the things that Dan has told me, and that's kind of what I'm going off of. So. Okay. That's kind of where I stand right now. We'll find out more as we get more information. And yeah. Okay. Okay. Then uh, Todd. I've always been for the 4K program. Um, we send our children away to grow. Barb, who's in the back, who's been kind enough to share information. We've done the 3K, the 4K. Uh, they do a wonderful job there. I've always been. Uh, my desire has always been to partner with the local uh, community option. Uh, I've made that clear from the get-go. I wouldn't want the school to take it over. I would like that partnership uh, to happen. What I've, and kind of what I alluded to a little bit ago, what I've seen, especially when my oldest son went into kindergarten and my oldest daughter is about to, the discrepancy in the community, the, the, the kids who have the background, who were offered or who you know, we're fortunate enough that the parents are able to afford to send them to a 4K program and the kids who didn't. And watching those interactions in this classroom with the teachers and noticing selfishly my child wasn't getting the amount of attention that I thought he should because they were having to bring these other kids up to the level that he was at. So part of it for me is wanting to bring all these kids up to the same level. At the same time, it's completely optional. So if you don't think 4K is the right fit for your child, then you don't have to send them to 4K. Um, you can continue keeping them at home. You have a ton of parochial options, whether it's St. Thomas or you know, the way to pro grow program. And I see a lot of variations that can happen with this, where Way to Grow could offer two versions. They could offer the state version, where it doesn't include any of the religious education, and they could also offer a version that does include the religious education, so they can offer uh, parents different options of ways to do it. But I'm a firm believer it helps the kids. I've seen it with my own children, um, uh, to say that they didn't benefit or to say that you know they would have caught up in third or fourth or fifth grade. Well. You know, by that logic, let's get rid of kindergarten and first, they'll all catch up in seventh grade. I mean, we can keep chopping it off at the knees and, you know, they'll all kept up, catch up eventually. But I am behind the program. I think we can make it work in the community. Um, that's it. Does anybody have any questions for me? No questions, just a comment I want to make. Has there been, or maybe a question, has there been any studies that have shown the effect that 4K has had on the preschools in the communities that they've been started up, started in. Because I'm really concerned about yeah. that because I prefer to see something like that stay yeah. in there. I think that like Verona is a great example because I think they're going to be three or four years in place now. I know they have all focused on community um, approach. They'd be a great one to call and say, you know, is that started this way, is it still that way, or is it, is it all of a sudden getting shifted to the buildings, or where, you know, if the facility doesn't meet the requirements, or the teachers aren't, the current teachers aren't DPI certified, and the daycare or the preschool doesn't want to bring those in, that, you know, that can create, I guess, a problem, depending on the role, and I don't know, but that's a, it's a good question, those are all things that need to be asked, and answers follow. Matt, I thought I read on the DPI website that they're all for the community approach? They are. Like, do they yes. Push, is exactly. that part of their, will that, they push it towards that? They very much push it that way. And you're right, if you go on their website, everything they talk about kind of flows in that direction of wanting to get the community participation and wanting the schools to partner with the providers in the community. That's yeah. definitely the way they push the program. In fact, when the grant money was available and still in place, emphasis was given yes. to the community model. Preference so. was given to that yeah. model. They don't do it that way, like in Miami Falls. That's right, that's all community, yeah. Yeah, but they don't have to offer, with the community approach, are they having to offer benefits that, like, the school districts offer? I think it's a dollar <coughs> amount that they get per kid. 
It's like no, a, no, no. Yeah. Do they have to? Do they have to pay their employees? That's what or I. Are they dictated at rates that they have to pay their employees, which then jack up the rates for the people who choose to do private? All the, all the, as I understand, all the preschools get the same amount of money per kid, and then what they do with that pay benefits, obviously. Has come under that. No, but under the K-4, maybe I'm not explaining. Are is the state able to come in and dictate what you're oh, paying, it, or it, is the community able to come in and dictate what you're paying that those staff people? It would depend on the model. So in those three models, he showed if the school district took their person and put it in there, then that would be a district employee. Your attention, please. The water we want community slash community versus the school saying, "Here, you get your own person, as long as they're DPI certified." You know, there's some you have credentials. You have to be a legitimate, you know, credential teacher. On the DPI website, um, it has all sorts of different uh, research related to four K. There's four different studies, one, 01, 02, 05. Um, then they go on to list seven more different studies, um, how it affects in a positive way. Of course, they're going to put that on the DPI website, but those are some resources, and they have them all cited, too. So. There are great resources on the DPI website. They've been doing this for a long time, so they do have a lot of stuff there. One um, independent research article I, I saw, I think this is worth saying, it said that um, 4K had a return of investment on like 63 cents on the dollar. And what that was is decreased special edu ed education services in later years as those kids were tracked. Um, other issues related to uh, behavior and, and stuff like that. Um, and Milwaukee was separated out by the Milwaukee had like a 78% or something like that return per dollar. So it, the interesting thing is remember that this is a cash positive thing. And then, so there are some other. I mean, you'll just, I'm, I'm bringing it up because those are all things that you'll find on the DPI website, in, in addition to the question you were originally brought up to. It's a pretty good resource. And also looking down the road, it's also been uh, noted that children that go to preschool are more likely to go to college, uh, less kids in the judicial system. So, I mean, there's a lot of positives down the road. It's not just now and not just getting into kindergarten. Yeah. It's long term. It's, it's important. Other questions or comments? I, one of the things I forgot to do was to have a sign-up sheet to be totally voluntary, but some of you had such good points today and you play such an important role, I think, in, in preschool right now in our community. If you wouldn't mind, I, I'm just going to leave this up here. And I would just use it to say, hey, here's something that's going on, so if you're interested in participating, uh, please come to it. Okay, so I'll just leave this up here for anybody that wants to just jot down name and email, really, so I would like to have anything else. Well, thank you very much for attending. It's greatly appreciated for taking a role in your community and, and hope to see you again at future meetings. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.